And I have a question. How do we take you to a bigger version of this script? Ah, there we go. Okay. And I'm trying to make uh, the, the part of the screen that's your image. So I apologize. I'm looking rude. The screen that you're on is right there. So I'm having okay. difficulty making eye contact. Um, <laughs> OK. All right. And then if you could say hello again, I want to see how the back of the room can hear you. Hello, test, check, check, test, test. Are we loud or OK? We're good? We're good. All right. And are we audible at all, or is this just a lot of noise right now? Uh, I can hear you clearly, Margo, and I can hear people in the background. It's not if some if someone in the back could ask a question, I could get a sense whether I can hear the questions without repeating. Tim, ask a question. It's two plus two. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't have my calculator, but I can. But I, anyways, I I heard it. Okay. All right. So we're good. So there's a uh, there's a line of, of people out the door that way where lunch is. Uh, so I think we've we've got maybe five minutes before before we're live. Um, the other thing I want to try setting up. I want to see if I can make the portion of the screen that's your presentation bigger, but that, that's going to take a moment for me to figure out. So I'm going to work on that while they're still coming in. Let's see. Can I make this bigger? That's good. <laughs> So I, have, I, have a, I have a question. At the moment, I can't make the screen share bigger than it is. Does, any, does anyone use this enough where they know how to make the sound part it's an icon you don't recognize. I would like you to. Okay. So I think now is your moment. But the floor is yours. Oh, we have an announcement. Before. We're not starting yet. Laura, I would like to tell you something. Quick announcement for those of you that were at the university faculty meeting, there will be an email coming campus wide for our Bucknell conversation. We call the president announced his own announcement on Tuesday. Was we have Bucknell community conversations. This is initiated by students. So students in November had their own conversations by themselves. So all students talking about campus climate and what they would like to change in order to improve the climate. Now they're inviting faculty to join in those conversations. Very important. This will occur on the 18th of April from 7 to 9. There's an optional dinner right before that. So I'm passing around. If you think, then I'll just put down maybe. Um, if you're not sure, and write down your name if you think you can attend. And at the bottom, if you want to volunteer to moderate discussions. So we're basically doing this on the second floor of the LC in, in micro groups, and we need uh, volunteers to moderate the discussions or facilitate discussions. There will be a training the day before from 11 to 1 or 5 to 7. So you can sign your name at the bottom. So please consider doing this and joining us in our professional conversations. Faculty and staff. Thank you. Is there a 
actually, they, um, their conversations in November have yeah. gone to the dean of students, yeah. and they are actually yeah. taking structural yeah. changes right now. Yeah, that's definitely. I'm not sure what that is. We'll collect the discussion from all the micro groups and then put them all together, and we'll get to an FLS in the fall to discuss that. Okay, so we're we're all here, so I'm going to introduce you, and you'll hear when you're on. Okay. Good. Sounds good. Excellent. Okay. All right. Oh, hang on. The dean's coming. We'll we'll let him get in before we start. Uh, so, so just the preliminary announcements. This is the penultimate. I love when I have a chance to use that word correctly in a sentence. Penultimate <laughs> last spring semester. Uh, so uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Next week, for the final one, we're going to hear from the president's task force working group thing on open learning resources. Their report's supposed to be coming out relatively soon. And uh, and then you'll have a chance to hear more about it and talk about it. And that one's going to be over in the library in the East Room. Oh, it is. Yes. Oh. I think it's going to be a little bit bigger than this room can handle. Oh, okay. So more bacon than the pan can handle. So we are moving to the library for uh, next week. Okay. And then after that, you have to get your own lunch on Fridays. Oh. Yes. But we'll we'll, we'll see you if we see you again next uh, next year. Uh, so, oh, we grew four more people, but, uh, so, um, I think just about everyone who's here now was here last week, that's good, but just in case you weren't, we were, we were uh, reflecting on uh, the big beacon manifesto, which was talking about the, the idea of a whole new engineer, and uh, this week, to uh, engage with that concept a little bit more, we have one of the authors and founders of this, David Goldberg, um, from Big Beacon, Three Joy Associates, an emeritus professor from uh, University of Illinois in uh, Urbana-Champaign, um, currently joining us via Google Hangout from Singapore. Uh, so, um, and a thing that, that uh, I, I know some of you would be interested in to be able to get into a Google Hangout, uh, you click an agreement with Google. Uh, so so this, this is uh, recorded. It's at the moment not broadcast to everybody, but it could be. But uh, but we're capturing this, so if that matters to you, you can choose not to ask a question uh, or not. But I'm just <laughs> just closing this bed. All right. So we just have the, the couple more people coming in, and uh, so Dave is looking at you through the eyes of my computer. So you see the little green light on there. That means he can see you. So you can wave and thank him for being up so late. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to turn over the floor to him. And then uh, we, we have a microphone here, so if we want to ask questions, uh, we can. Uh, but I will put that on mute so that when he's talking, uh, we don't have feedback. OK? But if you wave, I will unmute it, and we can ask a question. All right? All right, so without further ado, uh, thank you, Dave. Yay. <laughs> Th uh, thanks, Marco. And, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I'm excited to be with you um, uh, this afternoon. And, 
it, I am in Singapore, and it's just after um, midnight here. And I think um, that the the fact that I can come come and speak to you uh, this way is connected to uh, some of what I want to talk about. And uh, but I thought first I'd you know how does uh, um, kind of an ordinary uh, research professor uh, for for twenty some years I. I, I did the regular drill uh, first at the University of Alabama and, and um, uh, then at the um, University of Illinois. I had a uh, research program in genetic algorithms and evolutionary computation. And uh, then about um, 2006 or so, I wrote a uh, blog post that uh, changed my life in a way that I I didn't anticipate. Uh, I wrote a blog post uh, wondering about why there wasn't a philosophy of engineering like there's a philosophy of science, which seems uh, mild-mannered enough and, and not life-changing. But I, I got a note back from a fellow in the UK saying that the Institution of Civil Engineers was interested in that. And um, that led to um, uh, a couple of things. It led to me working with uh, Michael Louie to start something called Engineering and Tech Technology Studies at Illinois, which um, which led to um, the creation of the Illinois Foundry for Innovation and Engineering Education, which which then led to um, a successful freshman pilot and and um, and subsequent year uh, pilots uh, and. Uh, the change of of a fairly conservative culture to one that was more open to um, a transformative experience. Uh, it also led to a workshop on philosophy and engineering that's uh, been run now for um, four different times since uh, uh, starting in 2007. But um, all of that was moving along well, and I said, "Well, maybe uh, you know, maybe I should uh, go out into the world and become a dean or department head or." or or something like that, and and I um, I hired an executive coach, and um, she asked me some amazing questions. I think I have a story about that uh, a little bit later. But uh, that led to to me resigning my tenure at in December 2010, and uh, starting Three Joy as a uh, coaching, consulting, and training firm. It also led me taking uh, training as a as a coach. A leadership coach, and so now uh, um, I wander the planet, helping uh, people uh, who are interested in uh, transforming engineering education uh, do so. And so I've been here in Singapore since uh, January, uh, uh, and this has been part of a three-year um, uh, effort with NUS to um, uh, help move the needle on on uh, their their curriculum and uh, um, uh, pedagogy here. So. Uh, what I'd like to do is, um, you know, when we when we talk about um, when we talk about curriculum, when we talk about uh, these days, uh, a, a lot of the discussion. Uh, let's, something's not working here. Let's see. A lot of the discussion turns to educational technology and, and uh, a lot of it's uh, turned to MOOCs and I'm going to say something about MOOCs in a bit but um, I'd like to shift from talking about matters of the head um, to talking about matters of the heart because almost every experience I've had um, at Illinois in the US with other schools in Asia and South America and Europe um, has involved um, uh, uh, the uh, primary variables as emotional and cultural variables, and, and I want to illustrate that um, through four stories. And I'll I'll start with a head story um, about and, and tell and and sort of give a caricature of um, of of history since um, World War II, and and then I'm going to tell three heart stories uh, that I hope illustrate the the point. And, and my understanding. Annie, as you've, you've talked about the big beacon a little bit, and and I and I hope this approach uh, connects the dots as to why the big beacon manifesto is the is the way it is, um, and and um, you know we can 
pursue that connection uh, towards the end. So let's start with that uh, head story. And so I want to go back a ways uh, and recognize that universities and professors are, 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 are pretty old institutions uh, dating back to the 11th century. So the University of Bologna was founded in uh, 1088. Uh, and uh, you know, professors have been standing up and lecturing in front of classrooms for, for ever since that time. And in some ways, there's been a, a consensus about what professors do that has been uninterrupted since that time. Um, but I'd like to argue that um, that expertise, that standing in front of the class, that being the head of the, the research lab, um, is being challenged uh, by our times. And uh, I guess rather than talk about it, I'd like to show uh, a video. So, Margot, could you uh, could you put on? Um, uh, well, get ready to turn on the video. But let me just tell a little story. So, one of the things that I do um, as part of the Big Beacon is I, I do a fair amount of social media work. I I, I uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. And um, you know, so and I tweet about uh, educational matters. And so one day I get a tweet from a young man named Jack and Drack, and he says, uh, Dave, I'm interested in changing education too. Link. And he sent me the link, and Margo's going to click on that link, and we're going to watch a video about, about Jack. And we're back. It okay. wasn't. Okay, great. So, um, uh, yeah, so
I guess one of the interesting things about this um, uh, about this video is that um, you know, of course, uh, and actually the the ending of it um, uh, with the Einstein thing and so forth is actually less interesting in some ways than um, the fact that a fourteen year old could do this kind of research. Now, clearly, he's a bright bright young man. But how was it possible for someone to do that? Um, well, it's only possible because he can read the same papers that we can read. Um, that you know, there's been this uh, been this leveling of uh, of information access that's occurred in a relatively short time, and so Jack's able to read these papers and have these ideas. And when he goes to, to get a professor, what does he need? Well, he doesn't actually. He's not saying he needs the professor's brain. He needs the professor's lab equipment, and so it seems to me that there's, uh, you know, oftentimes we talk about what these things are doing to education, um, but I, I think one of the things that sometimes goes unnoticed is that uh, the the whole notion of expertise is being uh, undermined. Okay, and of course, you know, if, we, if we move on, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about MOOCs, uh, massive open online courses, and um, I, there's a when I when I do longer versions of this this talk, I tell a story of how the University of Illinois joined Coursera uh, from start to finish in the decision process in five days. Um, our our uh, our CS department head uh, was given the opportunity. He goes to our our chancellor, and she goes to the faculty senate in emergency session. And five days after the opportunity arose. We're in a group last July that joined Coursera. Well, I don't know about you at Bucknell, but the University of Illinois doesn't typically even buy a pencil in five days. And and the idea that 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 a, such a large decision would be made so quickly shows the urgency. Um, I would I would argue the fear um, that underlies uh, a, a a lot of what's driving um, uh, what's happening in in uh, the MOOC business with. Um, Coursera, edX, and Udacity. So you know, when we stand back from this, um, there's a there's a common denominator here, and it's connected to how I can connect with you uh, uh, this afternoon from Singapore. Um, there's this this reduction in information symmetry, and so if we 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 wind to rewind to uh, World War just after World II, World War Two, information was was what it was difficult to synthesize. It was expensive, uh, and it was sequestered. It was it was held tightly by those those who who had it. And it, and then uh, I label um, the three myths revolutions. That in other words, uh, we had the quality revolution, we had the uh, entrepreneurial revolution, and the information technology revolution. And I argue that they're missed in the sense that. Um, they're they're practiced in industry. They weren't missed by industry, but they're missed by the academy. We teach these things, but we don't we don't practice them. We're not quality institutions. Well, um, you know, we couldn't get nine thousand two uh, certification for ISO nine thousand two certification for for most universities. Um, we're not particularly entrepreneurial, and um, and and we use information technology, but uh, almost as an afterthought, not embedded like. Uh, in in um, in the value chain, like uh, uh, most modern multinational corporations do, and so if we sort of compare World War II information to to creative era information, information in our times, uh, information was hard to synthesize. Now it's easy to synthesize. It it was expensive. Now it's free or cheap, and it was sequestered or or hidden. Now it's widely shared, and so this information asymmetry that used to used to exist has been greatly reduced, but it's even hard to be a tyrant these days. Um, you know, being a tyrant dependent on control of information, and it's harder and harder to control information enough to support a tyranny. But um, for our purposes, what the returns to expertise have been reduced. The Jack and Dracas, um, you're seeing younger and younger entrepreneurship. Kids. Uh, uh, not waiting to graduate from school to go start their their companies, and again, a lot of that is because they can um, they can learn what they they need uh, over the net in order to start these companies. 
And so we're witnessing from 10, 1088 to now almost a 10 century consensus of our role of professors being undermined by technology and economics. And, and we could talk about if we could talk more about the economics, I would argue that it's transaction cost economics on the one hand and uh, returns to network scale. They're the, the two dominant factors uh, as opposed to um, uh, uh, returns to scale um, that dominated economics at the end of World War II that's, that's, that's causing this change. So I think one of the intermediate conclusions here is that those of us who have been trained as experts need to learn some new tricks, uh, but what exactly those tricks are is not clear, um, and that's part of what I want to talk about in, in the, uh, the three stories from the heart. So the, the first story from the heart is, is one about the power of trust, and it's, it's an iFoundry story. And uh, we started iFoundry uh, as a, a bootleg, um, bottom-up, uh, faculty-driven um, initiative at Illinois. Uh, Andreas Cangellaris, uh, head of now head of uh, electrical engineering at, Il at Illinois, and I. Um, actually, we were sitting around one day and and um, working on an uh, an NSF ERC proposal on the educational part of the, of a particular proposal. And uh, I'm talking, we're talking about innovation and creativity and, and uh, Andreas jumps up and uh, Andreas jumps up and gets kind of excited um, and he says, Dave, uh, why don't we teach this stuff to our kids? I said, Andreas, I don't know. He says, well, I'm going to go to the dean. I said, cool, great. So Andreas comes back and he says, Dave, I've got great news. Um, the dean uh, wants to appoint a committee and he wants us to help him write the charge for that committee. And, and I got pissed off. And I said, Andreas, I'm getting too old to be on another committee that writes a report and doesn't do anything. And uh, so we, we went back to the drawing board and the idea of iFoundry was born uh, um, uh, in reaction to the idea of forming another committee. And the idea was to have a, um, a pilot program or an incubator um, for programmatic change. So we usually use the term incubator for entrepreneurial startups. Uh, I guess this was an entrepreneurial startup, but, but for for um, creating and, and uh, piloting uh, programmatic change. So, um, so anyways, I want to fast forward from the founding moment to um, a time um, the first, uh, the first year, well, actually, so it's uh, uh, early um, 2009, and um, uh, in January we had a class uh, prior prior to offering any classes or anything really new. We had a, a class uh, called "Design the Engineering Curriculum of the Future," and um, for that we went and visited uh, uh, universities and and. Uh, institutions in the local area. We went to Rose Holman, we went to Purdue, but a couple of graduate students, uh, what, and I think we had uh, 18 students in that course. We had uh, 12 undergrads and six graduate students um, helping design the uh, engineering curriculum of the future, and, and two of us went to uh, Olin College, uh, showing a picture of uh, the academic building at Olin, and um, and it was, a, it was an amazing experience, but um, the, the part that I remember most was uh, in the afternoon we attended a class, of, it was a freshman class, second semester freshman class, and um, we, we were with, um, well, we were in a class that, uh, uh, where the kids had designed uh, heat sinks, and they were being tested. And uh, so the, uh, during the test there wasn't much going on, so the the prof said, "Go talk to these guys from Illinois." So the, they came over, and I remember, uh, I remember it pretty, pretty clearly. But um, and I expected that they would be bright, and they were, and I expected they would be articulate, and they were. But the part that sticks with me was uh, they started to they started to brag about their colleagues. They they talked about one guy who had uh, can't come up with a mechanical escapement in the predecessor course uh, to this course. Um, 
and, it, and they said this mechanism was so cool and, and how he came up with it. And then they started to talk about um, uh, other, other things, other accomplishments in some of their other classes. And I realized that, I, that these were fresh, freshmen and that they were already emotionally engineers. Technically, they weren't fully formed, but they, they already got it. Um, and, and I thought, that's kind of neat that so early in someone's education, engineering education, that they, they get emotionally what it means to be engin engineers. And I called that the uh, Olin effect. So we went back to, to Illinois, and uh, we admitted uh, 73 freshmen uh, in fall of 2009 uh, for something that now is called the Illinois Engineering Freshman Experience. At the time, it was the iFoundry Freshman Experience. And uh, this, this circle diagram um, has some of the elements of that first year program. So we had a, uh, in the center, the pieces of the program are shown. There was a course called uh, Intro Introduction to the Missing Basics of Engineering. Um, and uh, part of it, um, um, the part of it was uh, discussion of the missing basics. Uh, maybe you've seen this YouTube uh, TED talk that I've done, but anyways, it was uh, things like asking questions and decomposing and things, uh, decomposing problems and communicating and so forth. And and um, so it was uh, a, a very small footprint for the course, well, one hour course. Um, half of it, uh, the, miss, the missing basics, half of it a, a small projects course. And then the third element is this uh, I community, which was a, um, a community where the kids uh, worked on, uh, um, uh, worked together uh, in uh, communities of interest or practice. And so when the kids came in, we said, well, wh why do you want to be an engineer? And, and the answers fell into three categories. Uh, some, some, some said, well, we want to uh, save the world. Uh, uh, we want to. We want to do direct action in the world. We said, "Oh, beautiful," and we. And some said, "Well, I want to be the next Max Levchin. I want to be the next great tech entrepreneur." We said, "Great, uh, terrific. We support that." And then some kids just said, "We want to create cool technology." So, um, so we sent them off, um, and um, uh, it was interesting. They they. They talked to us, and at first we had a we had a nice uh, we had a nice launch where they, they we uh, went and did some uh, team building and and um, um, but it, again it was a one hour course and and the zero credit I community uh, we did some team building uh, at a local uh, summer camp and uh, that tested well um, uh, and so we had we had a great launch and a lot of enthusiasm but then there was there was a bunch of complaining. Uh, and, and it was a little bumpy, but it was bumpy in an interesting way. Um, um, and they, they said to us, uh, oh, we, in fact, we, you can still see their complaints. We had them blog during this class, and uh, the blogs in September and October were something to the effect, oh, these iFoundry guys, they don't know what they're doing. Why don't they tell us what we should do? Um, this is so disorganized. We, we don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, something interesting happened. We had the... Uh, uh, we had the checkpoint, so we had the I launch, we had the checkpoint, we had an expo. At the middle of the term, we had a checkpoint where they had to get up and make presentations about their plans. Um, each team had to make two presentations. And so um, the other thing that happened is the, their first project came due, and you can see this, the little steam car, um, uh, not really a design challenge, just really a fabrication challenge uh, to get them off and going. Again, this is a small course, not a lot of footprint. So they made these presentations. You can see in the foreground, the, uh, the uh, uh, Save the World team the, uh, called Engineering and Service to Society uh, with their green uh, uh, t-shirts that they made up to, um, to identify themselves and another group presenting up um, at the side of the room there. But anyways, it was, it was kind of interesting. So the evening was a beautiful evening. The presentations were great. Some, some of the plans that were fairly far advanced, we were, we were pretty happy with it. And we were having a Kaizen session at the end. Uh, and we said, we value improvement in iFoundry. And we said, tell us about what we should do. And we got some interesting suggestions. But then uh, a young woman raised her hand, uh, Jamie Kelleher, and she said the following. She said, you know, we weren't sure you were serious about us doing what we wanted to do. But then we realized you were, and it was very cool. And I looked at Karen Hyman, the associate director, and she looked at me, and we realized that something kind of special had happened. Um, 
but we didn't realize how special because from that moment forward the kids started to take initiative without asking permission. Uh, they, they went up to um, Chicago to visit their corporate and organizational advisors. Each, each team had at least one. They organized, uh, uh, um, they organized uh, um, activities uh, uh, for social events. They organized intellectual activities. Uh, uh, they organized a, a student-run uh, a series of workshops on passionate pursuits. They just started to, they, they, uh, the entrepreneurship team ran a 70-person uh, uh, workshop that next summer um, at the University of Chicago, not Illinois, with no help from us. Um, so they just started to do all kinds of cool stuff. We were blown away by it. And so we, we hadn't expected so much to happen so soon, so we, 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 we ran a quick um, uh, assessment of what was going on and, and um uh, and, and numerically, it came out really well. I'm not going to show the stats, but the qualitative responses were were gratifying. I'm, I'm sure I made the right career choice, uh, making me more confident in my decision to be an engineer. I'm definitely more entrepreneurial, and and my favorite, uh, just an overall all-rounded en uh, engineer, not just a technician, a human, not just a problem solver. And so we're going, wow, this is amazing, and we didn't understand it. It was puzzling to us. If you had asked me in September 2009 what we would be doing in September 2010, I would have said we would be expanding this insufficiently long course into something that might actually move the needle. But we concluded that we had actually gotten something like what we were after. We had gotten this Olin effect, this unleashing of the kids, and this emotional impact with, with almost no footprint in the curriculum. And we just didn't understand it. Um, you know, and how did such a small effort have such a big effect? So, I, and I want to return to that question um, uh, as we move on. So, let me tell a second story, and it's a Singapore story. Um, when I came to Singapore, my colleagues here would would say, "Dave, you're not in the United States anymore. Um, you're in Singapore, and in Singapore." Um, our students can't do X, and X could be, was any number of things. I said, well, Dave, if you like to do Socratic kinds of inquiry with them, if you go into classroom here, they won't answer your questions. Um, I said, oh, that's interesting. So we, um, I actually tried it. I uh, with uh, we we ran some uh, seminars on some of these issues and. And of course, the kids the kids could answer questions, and they were beautiful. And and uh, and then they said, "Well, Dave, Singaporean students don't do emotion. You know, you Americans are you're emotional, but you know, Singapore is one of the least emotional countries in the world. They won't do emotion with you." I said, "Oh, that's interesting." So, and I was working with uh, Dean Chan's uh, design centric curriculum, and so they assigned me to talk to. Um, talk to their students about their projects and um, and I remember one uh, group I was talking to about five kids they were in different groups but uh, we were talking about their projects and I remember one Indian chap and I said uh, I said um, uh, well tell me you know uh, he was working on a project having to do with food production I said well what is it about food production that's of interest to you and he said oh that will help people in the world and I said oh that's nice but tell me why, why it's of interest to you and he says um, he says well uh, anyways it, it, it turned out after asking several more times after we got to the heart of it that his grandfather had been a farmer and had lived through a, a devastating famine uh, where where uh, family members didn't have enough food to eat and so um, uh, and his father was a farmer as well, and so um, the the story was very personal, and it was very emotional, and he could talk about it. And so, um, I I have been around Singapore enough to to sort of disregard that story, but um, there was a particular time that uh, that that um, uh, sticks in my mind, and and. Um, I went to this school. This is a Hua Chung Institution. Hua Chung is the top um, 
uh, junior college, uh, uh, secondary school and junior college in the country. And um, so just to give you an idea, uh, the, the uh, generals of the three armed forces, the Army, Navy, and Air Force, were all Hua Chung graduates. Um, many members of the government are Hua Chung uh, graduates. Um, this is sort of the this is the elite of the elite, and and uh, and the kids are kids are bright kids, and and I was asked to come speak uh, about leadership. And again, my colleagues, my colleagues at Hua Chung said, uh, "Well, Dave, you know, you probably should work from PowerPoint, um, and uh, which I didn't do, and you should probably not ask questions, which I didn't listen to." And and the Hua Chung kids were great, and and uh, they got it. We were talking about leadership presence. And I said, uh, well, what makes a leader, um, we, we talk about people with great leadership presence. Well, what's that about? And they said, oh, you feel connected to them. I said, oh, beautiful. I said, oh, they, something, they feel charismatic. Uh, you, you trust them. I said, oh, great. Tell me some more. Anyway, so they got it. And, and we were talking about it in the context of presence as connection to others, authentic connection to others. And we were also talking about presence in the moment. Um, uh, uh, reacting to what happened, not to what you wanted to have happen, um, an essential part of uh, entrepreneurship theory these days. And so we were having this beautiful conversation interactively in this, um, actually in, in this room, in this lecture hall, and, um, and the kids are great and, and we're having a good time. And I, I, I spoke for, I don't know, 20, 30 20, 30 minutes, and then we did some Q&A, and I got some fairly, uh, you know, straightforward questions, and I was down near the front row, and a young woman uh, raises her hand, and, and, and she says, I have a question, and I say, well, what's, what's your question? And she says, uh, how do you learn the courage to be present as a leader? And uh, I knew what a, in the moment what a beautiful question it was, and I, I answered, I talked a little bit about fear and, and um, how we, and, and, and the way in which in some ways fear is, is an appropriate response to danger, but sometimes not a particularly appropriate response to the kinds of challenges that we face in our times now. Anyways, I, but I, I, I was reflecting on, on, on the question, and and it was actually interesting when I had come to Hua Chung, they showed me a video and the Minister of Trade was talking about, how he was exhorting the Hua Chung kids to work harder and do better things and he asserted sort of point blank that Singaporeans <clears throat> only aspire to the 85th percentile, not to the very top. And I think his point was to urge them to work harder and do better, but I, I wish he had been in the room to hear this young woman's question. It seems to me the aspirations there, uh, but they need a school system and, and uh, people to show up um, to help teach them the courage to be present as a leader. So the, the, the third story is a personal one. And, um, and it's a story about the difficulty of really believing in another person. And so in um, uh, September 2010, uh, I had already started 3Joy. I was preparing to leave the university December 10th. And um, uh, I uh, asked my coach where she had been trained because I realized how impactful she had been. The, the questions she asked really changed my life in a very direct kind of way. The reflection uh, that I went through on those questions led to the things that I'm now doing. And so I, I asked her and she said, well, I went to the Georgetown uh, University Leadership Coaching Certificate Program. And I, I looked it up and it looked kind of cool. So I signed up and in September 2010, I started the program. And um, it was a, it was a one of the, the single most transformative experience, I would say, uh, in, in, in my life in a, a certain way. And as part, of, as part of the experience, we had to coach um, three clients pro bono. And I had uh, one, uh, I had a couple of uh, department heads from um, a Southern University you would recognize. And uh, I had a local business uh, leader uh, that I 
that I had as my pro bono clients. And uh, two of the three clients were going great, but I had a, a, a young man who was a chemical engineering uh, department head at um, uh, the school, and uh, he was kind of, we were stuck in our coaching. Uh, he was having trouble showing up and making requests of his dean, and, and um, we talked about it, and we talked about it, and I thought I knew what he should do, but um, um, it, it, we just weren't going anywhere. He, we, we were just stuck. We were so stuck that I said, you know, have you seen the movie uh, Groundhog Day? Uh, and I uh, said, well, not recently. I said, well, let's go watch it. We both watched it. I had an insight. He didn't. Uh, we were still stuck. So anyway, so this is going along, and it's actually getting, it's becoming kind of a problem because it's the end of the class, so it's March of 2011 now, and um, um, it's it's March of 2011, and I'm... Um, I'm going to uh, Georgetown for the, my last uh, tranche of classes. So the way it was organized, you would go three days a, a month, uh, right in a row, uh, and then you do had a lot of homework and stuff in between, and you did your coaching and so forth, and wrote papers and and whatnot in between. And so it's March, and it's the Friday of of March 2011. So it's the last day of the last class of the course, and our last activity was to. Um, uh, do uh, observed coaching in groups. So we had a team of four student coaches and one uh, instructor coach in this group. And we did 20 minute uh, uh, sessions with each other while everyone else observed and, and uh, offered feedback afterwards. And so the first guy goes, and um, so this is uh, Georgetown, so you're in DC and a lot of the people come from the alphabet soup of Washington. So the first guy goes, at the time he was a, uh, uh, an HR fellow at uh, the CIA, um, and I'd heard him coach before, but that morning he was amazing, uh, just beautiful. Uh, uh, stayed with the client, great questions, um, just a terrific job. And I'd, I'd seen him coach down here. That morning he's up here. It's just, just, just great, and everyone was was taken with it. The, the next woman goes, or the next uh, coach goes, it's a, a woman uh, connected with the IMF. And um, she was actually having some trouble with some of the basics of coaching. She was having trouble asking open-ended questions, uh, was one of her challenge areas. Uh, but she had an even better session. It was like she, a visualization move, great insight on a tough problem in a short time. Just, just remarkable to watch. Third person goes, they're, they're coaching me. Um, I thought I had brought a tactical issue to the table, uh, some work problem that I, that I was dealing with, and uh, um, I was coached uh, by someone who at the time was uh, an educational researcher at Georgetown, a PhD, um, uh, cultural anthropologist. Anyway, so she's... Um, She's coaching me to beat the band, and I realized in that session that my issues weren't tactical. They were actually strategic, and many of the things that I had been working hard on, I just hadn't seen the connection, and I had the insight from that session to see it. Um, and so now it's my turn. I should have uh, performance anxiety. I've just seen three of the most amazing coaching sessions that I've ever seen. And it's my turn to go, but I was, uh, I was centered. I was calm about it, and I had a good session with my client. So after this, we're, we're sitting around and we're going, what happened? What, what was that about? Because we all realized that we were all coaching over our heads. We were all newbie coaches. None of us should have been coaching that well in a certain sense. And we're just puzzled by it. It was like, what, what was that about? And, we, and coaches have kind of a language they use to explain, oh, we were present, we were centered. We were using those words. And they and they and they weren't working for us. It was like it still just seemed like a bit of a uh, a, a bit of a puzzle. And then so finally the instructor spoke up and he said, "Well, I have a word. His name's Mike." And he said, "Well, what what's the word, Mike?" He said, "Love." He said, "You were all here in unconditional love for the other, and you trusted the other person." to find their own answers. You were here without ego and complete support of the other person. 
I said, wow, love, that's not a word we use in engineering very often. And uh, what does that mean for, what does that mean for me as my, as a coach? What does that, what does that mean for me in my life? Um, and, but the, the sort of bottom line of the story was I went back with uh, my client at the school, the chemical engineering department head, and um, we had a session. Actually, the ses it was the last session. It was our 10th session, and it was also recorded. I had to record the session, and it was essentially my final exam to demonstrate that I could meet the International Coach Federation uh, competencies. And um, um, so I went into the session in the same way of the morning, and um, he had a breakthrough. He wasn't stuck. Um, he figured out a way to get through to the dean and, and make the request that he was having trouble making. Now, I don't want to say that he, you know, he lived happily ever after, but this thing that we were stuck on, he was able to do as soon as I stopped knowing what he should do. And um, so it seemed to me um, that from these experiences, uh, I, I asked the question the young woman asked in Singapore, how do you learn the courage to be present as a leader? I think you learn that from um, those who have the courage to check their egos at the door, um, believe in your capacity and trust you, and are connected and open to you while you explore and learn. And it seems to me that that's connected, those three things are connected to the kinds of skills that we need um, as profs in an age where expertise is under attack to balance our expertise and our coming into the classroom with what we know to also come into the classroom with, uh, with the ability to really believe in, um, in those beautiful young people who are sitting in front of us. And so um, we, we talked in the Big Beacon about various things, but if you summarize them, the, the pillars of the Big Beacon sort of organizationally and institutionally are, are the things, these words that we've been talking about, things like joy, trust, openness, connectedness, and courage. And Dave, uh, I'm going to yeah. jump in on you. Cause, yeah. Because we're hitting the 52-minute mark, at which point the, the students are going to start coming in and we're going to have to start turning over. Okay. Uh, for which I apologize. But <laughs> um, I want to say thank you very much for your time here. And I know uh, many of my colleagues uh, may have questions for you. And what I will do is, uh, if it's okay, I'll make sure they see your email address um, and know about the, uh, the Twitter chat where they could get involved with the conversation after the fact today, if that's OK. Sure, that's fine. All right. Happy to interact um, that way. OK. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Let's go with hats.